Hello, people. Uh, this week, I read The Fires of Vesuvius by Mary Beard. This is... Well, first off, if, in case you don't know, this is about... I think Vesuvius is the mountain? The volcano? This is about Pompeii, the city that got completely covered in ash just like overnight right that's the claim to fame so it's it's you start digging it up and it's just perfectly encapsulated the moment the moment it happened and our author is mary beard a real deal historian a roman historian so when you read this book everything you read will be full-on factual facts. You know, this isn't, uh, what do we say? This isn't historical fiction. She's not taking license. Um, if someone says, no, that, that's not the way it was in Pompeii, and you'd be like, yes, it the crap was. Mary Beard said so, mother clucker, right? It's that level. She's the real deal. When you need to know some answers about some Roman stuff, she might be one you go to. That, that's just the level we're at, and that's what we're dealing with. So on the one hand, when you start to read this book and it's less interesting than it could be, right? It's not story-based. The, the fun isn't in that. The fun is in that everything you read, you can put weight on. Everything you read is the real deal, right? That's that's the fun of this book. So we're when the book gets into, you know, like lists of food, bread and fish and figs and types of plates, you're like, this is kind of boring. But then you realize, oh, right, it's history. It's actual history. And it's not, what do we say? It's not... It's just a little above a textbook, right? So a textbook sort of lays things out in a kind of a, I'd say, educational manner. This is more, I would say, conversational. I, I can feel like not so much a lecture, but just a little less than just sort of an expert giving you the intel. You know, not not it's not meant to be back and forth. It's not meant for me to take notes. Like a, like a classroom, it's, it's, it's a little more free-flowing than classroom. That's what I'd say. It's, very, it's a very good book. We get into the situation itself. And, and she makes the point early on, which is it's true. It's the same reason I picked up this book. Well, hold on. The, the same reason that I got this book is the same reason your Mozart went to, to check out this town. Your Queen Victoria went, right? the same reason that it captured the imagination instantly in the 1800s and why it's continued to capture imaginations all the way to now. It's the idea, right? Because you go to, you go to Pompeii, I don't know if they're like there now. I guess there'd be models of them now. Probably moved to museums. In, in any case, you can go to Pompeii. The people who first dug it up would... You'd see, you see bodies, you see people, you see humans. And in various stages of how people would be in a disaster. Some of them are hiding in a, in a building. Some are running along the street. Some are trying to haul wagons full of stuff. Uh, there's one guy, one guy who left with just the keys in his pocket, right? And you, keys in his pocket. Another guy's a doctor who left with just his medical bag. You can you can feel these people, even though it's been I don't know, was it two thousand years, something like this, a thousand years? Through the era, through the eons of history, it's like you can you can understand them one to one. You can understand what it'd be like if if storm clouds are going. And you and your people got it in your heads that you have to leave your house. That you put your keys in your pocket. Why? Because I'm coming back. 
I'm going to lock the door and I'm coming back. But the reality is, your entire, not just your house, your entire town has been covered in, I don't know, 10, 12 feet of ash. It, it, when you come back, it's just a new landscape. If you even make it, right? Because some people are dying along the way. You, you, there are some people who are clearly rich. There's a rich lady. And she ends up at like a barracks. And here's another part that's fun about this book. And, and Mary Beard does it throughout. Where she kind of gives archaeologists the business. Right? She's a historian. She's not an archaeologist. She doesn't go dig things up. She gets the things that are dug up and figures out something about whatever we're looking at. So here's the people digging stuff up with their little spackles. And they dig up this rich lady in the barracks and they jump right to, this is um, a rich lady cheating on her husband with some army guy, right? And the Mary Beard's like, yeah, calm down with all that. It's, it, you can almost feel her running, the ash coming. She stops in here to get out from away from it. And then that's her final stop. I'm like, that makes more sense to Mary Beard and to me. But it's fun. It's fun that she gives them the business a little bit. Somebody should. Somebody has to. I can't, right? I'm not an expert. But Mary Beard can. We then in it's not very late in, but instead of just because that's sort of superficial, I'd say superficial. Where I see a body, I see a dog a tie, you know. I see a doggo still on his leash up under the ash. These are sort of superficial information. But what we start to get out of this book is is sort of uh, much deeper. Because what we end up doing is using the example of it right now. What she says is this is not the selling point. The advertisement is that it's a town frozen in time. And she's like, it's not exactly a town frozen in time. And, and you have to get some facts established so that you can understand better what it is you're looking at. Now, it is a Roman city. It's humming, right? Rome is humming and the city is humming. But then there's aftershocks. These, not aftershocks, these pre-earthquakes. And of course, your mountain's going to be gloomy before it explodes. So she says a, a good number of people have left. Right? Everyone that had lived there didn't die there. And it's important to know that, that this is the state the city is in. So it's not exactly a 100% this is what a Roman city was if you froze it in a moment. Right? So you, you take that into your mind, but then you start looking around. And the things that they start to find would be, uh, weirdly, the paint tells you a lot. Advertisements tell you a lot. Um, the monuments tell you a lot. So, you'd have, let's say, a painting in a house. And the painting is of a dog on a leash. And so the door is half open, so you can see this dog on a leash that's painted from the street. Right? And there's one story of somebody getting spooked by seeing one of these, because... Dog on a leash is something that's normal to Roman towns. And that's what she starts to do. What is what I see in Pompeii similar to the things I've seen in other Roman towns or read about? And between the two, you can start getting a better idea of what's happening. But it's it's not just a dog on a leash. She, she didn't... you. Um, The fact that there's a dog on a leash, the fact that doors sometimes remain ajar, right? Um, it starts to tell you about how the people function in their in their environment. The fact that your restaurants are on the poor side of town, that poor people eat at restaurants and rich people have dinner parties. Rich people have things that are in their house and that in their house they would have wraparound murals. Of, of all sorts of things, right? You start learning how they, Romans, ancient Romans, interacted with Greek mythology, with 
mythologies of their own, right? It's, it's, it's history telling me history. It's very fun. You get this sense that, right, because she talks a lot about how small everything is, how it's almost claustrophobic it would feel. But then she also talks about how certain rooms are used for the public, not just a normal house, right? My house, I live in it and people I know come in it. But in a Roman house, if you're Cicero, I think you had a house over in Pompeii. Cicero had a house here. And there are letters about what kind of statues he wants to put in it, what kind of paintings he wants to put in it, because he's going to greet important people in his house. Because again, poor people go to restaurants, not rich people. And so this thing serves as a political instrument. The, the closeness of it teaches, you know, sort of gives you the sense of how Romans want to interact. A politician wants to be face to face. And so he doesn't make this this large space where people can get away from him. Right? You almost you're almost pulling them to you. Pulling them so they have to see the wealth that you're laying out on the table. That they have to admire your goblets. And also there's not like there's much to see outside for them anyway. Not anything that interests them, right? Us, we would be interested in glorious vistas. Them, they have glorious vistas everywhere. A modern age hasn't bulldozed it, right? So for them, that's not that big a deal. For them, would what would be a big deal is, you know, serving ostrich. And you get to talk about eating this exotic animal. It's about how good of paintings you have. Uh, the expenses of the, of the paint you used to impress this part, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I can imagine even in sort of the servant quarters, it'd be the same. You, you, you get this closeness with people around you because that's your support structure. She says early on that there are no destitute people in Pompeii because if you're destitute, you starve to death. There's no welfare. If, if you're just starving on the street, you just starve in on the street. Uh, unless in Rome, you, you have some angle, some way to produce for yourself, right? Let me use my strength to be a farmer. Let me use my, my cunning to steal. Let me use my steady hand to be an artist, etc., etc., right? But you have to work your way into something. So if you're a servant there, you're like, I'm like, you want to be close to people around you. You don't want to end up on the street. Which sort of leads us to slavery. There were slaves in Rome. But again, history is very long. History is very long. And the concept of what a slave is varies throughout it. Essentially. Right? So our idea from Hollywood movies, the black slave, the, the horrible southerner whipping them. Accurate. True. American. Yes. We all agree on that. But that's not how every slave is treated throughout history. They're not all beaten senselessly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It varies. So you, in a, in a weird way, you might have to take out of your head some of the notions that are in there to understand what's happening. Here we have, it's, 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 slaves get got the sort of the same way, I'm assuming. Through wars, I know a lot of the Greeks ended up Roman slaves. But one of them, one of them wrote a history of Rome. But that he's like, he's an educated person, he'll be an educated slave. Uh, I think Cicero had a slave or probably, or, or two, be assistants, write things down for him, etc., other people would have slaves that are just manual laborers. Slaves could earn their freedom. They could earn Roman citizenship. They could become wealthy as slaves, earn their citizenship, not be allowed to be in the Senate, but then their children would. 
be allowed to be in the Senate. So some people can go from slave to senator in a family lineage. You know, it, it's this different idea of, of slavery that you can witness in this Pompeii book. In spots over and over, right? Obviously, the poor people don't have slaves. They're just out working. But basically every rich person in this city would have a servant's quarter, and those servants would literally be slaves. That They own this person. And I'm assuming there are all types of rules about the slave that you have. And these, I mean, it's Rome. These slaves came from all over. They weren't all black. European, Arab, black. Wherever they grabbed them from, they could make slaves out of them. Um, we have we have a point a part in here where it's the sort of the um, the second history of of Pompeii. So there's the Roman history, then it's buried, and that ends right. No, we, the Romans didn't show up and dig the town out from under who knows how much ash. There's no need. You just move on. That town's gone. The people who lived lived moved to another town and you just keep on keeping on. But there's not the end, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't know about it. There are <laughs> they found some bodies in there that sort of didn't align. And so you wonder what how did this body get in here? Well what ends up happening is at the time or maybe a hundred years later, who knows when it happened. Dudes decided, oh, right, there was a town there. I wonder if some of the stuff's still in it. Well, it turns out there is a lot of the stuff still in it. And that stuff is valuable. If you go and dig up a golden snake bracelet, it's a golden snake bracelet. It's worth a lot. Now, us, it'd be worth more because it's from Pompeii. But for them, it's just gold. So what you'd have is dudes try and dig down there. Find a house. Dig into the rooms you think would be the stuff. And get the stuff and get out. Problem is it's ash. Not the steadiest of ground. And you might be 12, 15, 20 feet underground. Snaked down into a room. The whole thing collapses. And now second victims ha are, are buried in Pompeii. After the fact. Extra dead people. Very funny. You have to sort through all that. You also have to sort through, again, your archaeologist. It was discovered sometime in the 18th, 1800s. And people are wild. So you're steadily bit digging this place up. You know a king or some other dignitary, the Queen Victoria, something like this, is going to show up. And, you know, conveniently, a body is found while this rich person's there. This might not actually be a body. It might be a body that was there that now got moved, right? So you have, again, the 18th century is history for us. It's been long enough, that's history. And history is now affecting older history. It's very fun to me for some reason. But you do have you have to sort through what archaeologists may or may not do, right? Some of them, I think, glued teeth on because they thought that would look good. A lot of what they call it, the second death, Pompeii's second death. So it's a tourist attraction. You're an eager beaver. What do you do? I'm digging everything up. What you dig up is a full head-to-toe Roman house. It's amazing. This is fantastic. Well, what are you doing is dark. Well, I go home and I go to bed. Well, what about the site? What about the site? And I'm sitting there like, you're just going to let it get rained on? You're going to let freezing happen and rain and cold and, I don't know, bugs to roam around in there? And I'm like, yeah, why not? Well, this is what they did. And we went, we had full sort of panoramic Roman paintings that just sort of evaporated because they're they're made of what they're made of it's oil it's egg tempura it's plaster right and their elements start to get to it we have somewhere 
They tried to save it from the dew and they, you know, dab it with cloth and wax. And so now the wax is doling some spots and the cloth ripped the art off others. You know, oh, it's a bit of a tragedy, right? So on the one hand, it sucks. They, our fellow 18th century man did a terrible job of saving this thing. But on the other hand, um, again, the popularity of it Various artists flocked down to it. Talented artists getting a first-hand look at the murals on the wall and doing a painting on the side, on canvas, on sketchbooks, etc. Right? And through some of these paintings, we have it preserved. And is it exactly what they saw? No, because I mean, the exact thing is on the wall and disappeared. But it's not like... It's not like we left the archaeologist to sketch as best as they could, right? This is the a trained hand. And so in that sense, some of it's been preserved just through, just through diligence. This isn't the only, you know, of course, this isn't the only paint on the walls. And this is where a lot of the history starts to then get filled up. We have graffitis. Um... Also, sort of like, I think there there would be the akin of sort of posters, town type, governmental paperwork put on walls. So, it's not paper. It it was painted on, and it says so and so. You know, vote for so and so for this sort of political office. And then later, when another thing needs to be put up, they paint over the old one. Well. We can sift through these layers of paint and not lose it, right? Because it was covered in ash and because it was so thick at the time, we didn't lose it all. And in that way, we were able to read deeper in the history of this town than, than we normally could have. We, under, we, we know how they would advertise for, you know, gladiatorial, gladiatorial games how actors might have been advertised for, the types of things that they might have done on stage. Uh, mime, I think, pantomime, which to them was more like a dance than what we think it is now. Um, we can assume this is how most of the masses, because gladiatorial events, uh, acting plays, this type of thing would all be in the way the Romans did it. It's the rich would sponsor these things for the people. It was a thing they were expected to do. And of course, the people would judge them on how well it is, and you either stay in office or you don't, etc., etc. And obviously, being in political power gives you some juice, meaning we're gonna go, we're gonna lean towards this crop versus that, and I'm richer because of it, etc. There's always reasons to be in politics. But the fact that we're using that graffiti on walls to get a sense of what's happening in town. And this is why you want a Mary Beard to do it and not maybe just an archaeologist. Because she can contextualize. Once, once we get more established in the time zone of where we are because of various facts we've found, right? So if... if such and such person put on their tombstone, I built all these great things for town. And then this other paperwork says, this gladiator came. I can know this person did it at that time because they're dead at this time. You know, context clues. We piece it together and we can say this happened, right? So if this graffiti is in the same layer as that poster, we can know that's when Nero visited, or something to this effect, when Nero was nine, right? But if you just leave it to the archaeologists, they will translate the Latin as it is. But as it is, is it as the same as it is in context? So, what is it? If, if you said that's gay 45 years ago, that meant something completely different Oh, what is it? Not 45, like 50, 60 years ago. That would mean something completely different than that's gay now. Gay in the back in the day used to mean happy-go-lucky, carefree. 
gay now means, you know, homosexuality. From happy-go-lucky to a slur almost, right? So if you don't understand the context even of, of language, you might misinterpret some of the stuff we're seeing. So our Mary Beard isn't missing a lot of these things. Sharp knife. That's why this is fun. But it is cool to see how they would set up um, a gladiatory fight. How they would run an election. Um, it's even fun sort of breaking down how their roads were. She says there's some parts where it's, too, it's deeper than it should be. And so that sort of lends itself to thinking we had a lot of water flow. We have fountains. Romans loved fountains. Again, that was another public work made for and used by the public. The rich had their own in-house in fountains. They loved the sound of water. Again, status. And even for the common man, the fact that you drink your water out of a fountain and not out of the river is the status for you. That's what's better about being Roman versus just a barbarian. Even if I'm poor, even if I'm a poor Roman, that's better than a barbarian, right? Standard, status, all these things. Even down to, right, like how much they might have cleaned. So... Rome had a sewer system. The, the poopies went down into the sewer. Pompeii did not. It wasn't, it wasn't deeply dug under. So you're seeing that these gutters and water, deeper water channels are how they sort of kept the city clean. That they were, they did care about it. It's not like noon. It's not like some old Victorian towns where <laughs> sort of dank and dirty. They at least set up their town so that when it rained, the washout is literally cleaning their town. And if it didn't rain, maybe, you know, a bucket or two of water here or there is helping the thing along until it does rain. And that's also fun to see sometimes that a group older than a modern group, right? So the fact that Romans may have been cleaner than Victorian England, sort of trippy to me because one's more modern. You think we always advance, but sometimes we don't always advance. Sometimes we take odd angles for no reason. As I say we, I mean human beings. This is essentially the book, though. And it's, again, more detailed than I'm going to get. I'm not giving every little detail. Um, but this is the book. It's, it's, it's a deep, deep dive sort of tangentially into Roman history because Pompeii was Roman. But with the, the backdrop of these facts that this buried town can give us, that, that's what we're dealing with in this book. And it's a very good book. I'd recommend it if you're, if you're, good, if you're big into history. If you're big into Rome, give it a go. I don't, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Who, who's who's going to be disappointed coming out with a lot of facts? I don't know. This is also the type, if you bought it, this is also the type of book that can stand up to a reread or a re reread. Because, you know, it's not, it's not, again, it's not a textbook. You don't have to take a test afterwards. But you're also not going to remember everything that you read. And so that the next read or the read after that just strengthens the knowledge that you're going to, you're going to gain from it. Okay. Add time. I know it's a short video. It is what it is. I can't help it. These are my books. This is what I can help. These are my books. I've controlled everything that went into them. I think they're good, but I'm going to be honest with you. By the time I was done, I was a bit cross-eyed. What did they say? Too far in the woods to see the trees. And I kind of lost perspective, maybe, a little bit. So I can't tell if they're good or not, to be honest with you. I do know when I read them, I enjoy them. And when I read my own books, I can't imagine sort of what I would change much. But there it is. If you want to help the channel buy a book or subscribe or just, you know, sort of watch and comment. It's all up to you. I thank everyone for listening this far and I'll see you all next week.